two weeks before CES. We're getting ready to bring it in. Dale has worked out this stuff for line draw. There's no line draw in the hardware. And the, hardware, the other guys in the software guys are saying, come on, Dave, you can do it. Put line draw on the hardware. What are you, nuts? There's two weeks before. These things break every time we breathe. You can't turn lights on and off. Some wire falls off the pin. You want me to change the design, rewire it. All these guys are going to go put line. You're out of your minds. No way. Bob Pariseau comes in and says, yeah, Dave, we have to have it, and jokingly grabs my arm. Mitchie, this nice little dog, this dog that I have not even pretended to like, leaps to my defense. <laughs> Here Pariseau was grabbing my arm, twisting it. Come on, Dave, you can do it. Mitchie jumps up, attacks poor Pariseau. Ah, what could I do? I did line draw. I had no choice. <laughs> Mitchie came and saved me from a fate worse than death. And yep, yep, so we did it. We squeezed and we ran and we screamed. And the hours before CES in the middle of the night, you and Dale were in there writing code and stuff. And they were sitting in Chicago working under the bench. So the hardware first came together about nine, ten days before the show. And the hardware guy said, here you go. Okay. <laughs> so here's what they delivered to us. Most of you probably know that inside the Amiga are three high-performance chips. And the first pass at designing the hardware for the chips was, of course, not to actually do the chips, but to create something in hardware that performed like the chips would perform one day. This is actually an illustration of the Agnes chip. Um, this is a, a, the real one, by the way. This is the one that we first had, the first one that came together. And I think there's eight, eight breadboards on there. And each one of those boards had about 250 chips. So, you know, times eight, lots of chips. Unfortunately, lots of things can go wrong with lots of chips. And there were three of these, one for each of the chips. There was also a fourth one that was the, uh, the breadboard itself. The whole machine also, by the way, was called Lorraine. Lorraine was our code name for what we were working on. Lorraine was the name of the president's wife, too. And at first, she was honored to have the machine named after her. She came in during those nine days between when we got the hardware and CES, and she heard the things we were saying about Lorraine. <laughs> then she wasn't quite so honored. <laughs> All the while that we were working, we had harder guys that were constantly on call. Here, for instance, is a picture of one of them. <laughs> they were there the entire time that we were there. There was always some hardware guys there. The softer guys came and went. Um, Dale Luck and I, in particular, worked there almost the entire time. Uh, those entire nine days, we worked nonstop trying to get stuff done. A lot of my work depended on the things that Dale was doing, and so I was constantly badgering him. It was, okay, I'm working real fast, I am. Here's a picture of Dale working real fast. <laughs> what Dale was doing was he carried around his pillow with him the entire time that he was working there, and the computers that we were using at the time had a program on it that we wrote called Beep. You type in Beep, and it would beep. And it had a type ahead buffer, so you could type in an instruction and have the computer go ahead and do that instruction, which would take a while. And you'd also be able to type in beep long before it would actually be executed. So what we used to do, and Dale was an expert at this, he would carry his pillow with him at all times. He'd type in the compile instruction, type in beep, and go to sleep. <laughs> Five minutes later, beep. He said, oh, yeah, oh, back to work. Back to work. So, back to CES. This was our booth. They had on the right-hand side this little tiny part with, you know, games around the outside and joysticks and stuff. And over here on the left, they had this massive, huge area with no windows and no way to know what's going on inside of it. And one door with this enormous burly guy that said, yeah, what do you want? You know, anytime you wanted to come in. Anytime we wanted to take anyone back there, we had to bribe the guy 50 bucks to let us in. You know, okay, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. And, um, Inside that back room is where we showed the Amiga. The entire day of the show, we would bring people in one after another, and it was a great experience. And if you'll pardon my grammar, during the entire CES show, the one most oft-repeated comment that we heard was, oh, shit. <laughs> because, of course, no one had ever seen a computer back in 1983, or uh, January of 84, do the kinds of things that this machine did. 
Here's a picture in the middle of the demonstration at CES. This is uh, Bob Parasol, who was the original Amiga evangelist, and boy, he used to do a song and dance that you wouldn't believe. The guy was incredible. Sitting next to him is Glenn Keller, one of the great hardware whizzes of the project. And it may look like that he's assisting Bob Parasol at the demo, and Bob Parasol is rolling merrily along, but in truth, the hardware just died. <laughs> and it froze on a picture, fortunately, so Bob was able to continue as if everything was okay, but Glenn is working furiously in this photograph trying to get the thing to work again. At CES, we'd always have the same failure every time. The same set of chips would blow up, and I knew which chips were. Glenn pointed them out the first time. So these are the chips that always blow up, Dave, every time we have this little static problem. Jay thought we were brilliant. The system would go down. Yeah, we'll go look at it. <laughs> Change the same chips every time, no matter what was wrong. And it would fix it. It was a trick, Jay. It was a trick. We knew what that was. That's where the, the bouncing ball really started, was one late night at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. And uh, but around 11 or 12 o'clock, um, I guess, uh, Pretty much it was over. People were going to go back to their rooms, but RJ and I decided we had a few things we wanted to do back at at uh, the convention center where CES was. And so, um, about four o'clock in the morning, after I think we had about a six pack of warm beer left over too that we'd hidden in the you know those little stands that they put plants in. And um, I finally got it to where I thought it was reasonable, and I fell asleep. Um, and about 8 o'clock in the morning, we got woke up by the guys coming back in to the booth and they're, like, their mouths were dropping and they're going to go out and bring all the, the potential customers back in and say, look at, see, look what this, this, uh, this can do now. Later on, we finally did, um, we added some stuff that were desperately needed for the next CES show and um, we added the horizontal so that it would bounce left to right besides just up and down. And one thing that it desperate, desperately needed was, was the sound. I, I envisioned something that was like, boom, boom, like something really big and, and ominous and, and, and it was going to blow your socks off. And um, so we searched around to get just that right sound. And we finally, um, after a lot of experimentation, we got uh, Bob Pariseau took one of these foam bats, and we had two of them that we used to, to work out disagreements, and was starting to hit different things. And then Sam would record the sound on his Apple II, to, and then he would massage the data so we could play it on the Amiga. And we finally came up with a perfect sound, which was Bob um, hitting uh, an aluminum garage door, you know, one of those garage doors that goes up and down, and Sam on the other side with his microphone digitizing the, the sound that was ver reverberating through the garage. And so that's how the, the uh, bouncing ball, the, the bong uh, sound was developed. And it was a great show. It was a, a moment of great success. You know, everyone who saw it was awestruck by the thing. A lot, of, a lot of the software developers agreed to get behind it. Some hardware people said, you know, it's interesting. We want to know more so we can start to design hardware for it. And we were ecstatic. We we're in heaven. We did really well at the CES, and everyone was still working together. We still had that great passion, that great sense of pulling together as a team to get everything done, but it, it started to feel in the air as if, as if it was going to go bad because there was just less and less money all the time. It was getting harder and harder. You know, we knew the, the kind of debts we had run up with our creditors and the fact that we weren't paying them. 